You know, this is a really good 1 millihenry inductor. Unless you try to use it at 3 MHz. Then it's a really good 25 picofarad capacitor. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at filters and discuss what are some of the problems associated with LC inductor capacitor filters. The main thing to look at is the components themselves. So even though when calculating or simulating any value is acceptable and any filter can be created, in practice you will soon realize that some specific implementations are just not possible. So what sort of problems do you run into with the typical capacitor and typical inductor? Well, the first thing to look at is the conditions under which these components switch properties. Now, the simple equivalent model of both the capacitor and inductor contains the same three basic elements, a capacitor, an inductor, and a resistor. In the case of the capacitor, these are all in series, and the inductor is called an equivalent series inductance. And while for the inductor, the elements are in parallel, and the capacitor is called an equivalent parallel capacitance. In both cases, the resistor is called equivalent series resistance. Now, the reason why these are equivalent something components is because they are not added into the construction of the inductor or capacitor as discrete components, but rather they represent various phenomena and unintended behaviors. Regardless, these need to be taken into account to understand the real behavior observed with these components. So, because we have both types of reactive elements, this leads us to a resonance event. At some frequency, the two components have the same reactance that cancels out. In the case of the complete component, this is called a self-resonant frequency. And while the self-resonant frequency frequency can be calculated with the generic formula. So when plotting out the impedance, the component will have one type of behavior up to the series resonance frequency and the other type afterwards. So if you need the component to keep its properties, it should be used well below the self-resonant frequency. However, when talking about LC filters, where you need the component to also have a very precise value, we can get a bit more insight on what can go wrong when we also plot out the exact reactance value. So the components will present a more or less flat value, so frequency independent, at low frequencies. But as you approach the self-resonance frequency, there is a steep increase before jumping to the inverted type of component. Ideally, when building filters, at least for the passband, you want to keep your components about one decade below the self-resonant frequency to be in the flat value region. The same rule applies for both capacitors and inductors. So if we look into a good component datasheet, you will be able to observe this value variation. So this is the datasheet of a air core inductor from Coilcraft. So here for the 66 nanohenry version, we see the self-resonance frequency documented at around 436 megahertz. And if we look below, we also have a graph showing the actual inductance as it varies with frequency. So starting from the self-resonance, about one decade below, at roughly 50 megahertz, we can see that the slope of the graph starts to change. So up until this point, we have a flat inductance, after which it starts to rise. Now, when we turn to capacitors, for example, this is the datasheet of a ceramic capacitor from TDK. Even though the self-resonant frequency isn't normally a parameter in the datasheet, it can still be observed in the various graphs, specifically the impedance graph. So here we can see impedance dropping up to the resonant frequency, and then impedance starts to increase. And well, in certain cases, you will also see a capacitance graph. For this particular component, we see the same type of value variation like with the inductor. So starting from the self-resonant frequency, about one decade below, we see that capacitance starts to increase. And well, up until that point, the capacitance value is more or less flat. Now, self-resonance is a phenomenon that occurs for all reactive components at some frequency. However, you can run into various issues well before that. Based on the exact materials used to build a component, you can observe a variation in their properties based on the use case, signal strength, frequency, temperature, and other parameters, well before the self-resonant frequency. So the first thing to look at 
is how exactly the value of a component can be determined. The basic formula for a plate parallel capacitor and a solenoid inductor involves taking into account the exact physical dimensions and the environmental permeability or permittivity. For starters, the mechanical dimensions are temperature dependent, so the materials will dilate and contract with temperature, changing size, and thus value. However, this isn't nearly as bad as what can happen to the dielectric isolator or the magnetic core. Now, not all materials are created equal, of course, but in general, the larger the relative dielectric or permeability constant are, the more unstable the material is. Things like high dielectric constant ceramics or high magnetic permeability cores will be far more unstable compared to lower value materials. Multiple factors can impact the final observed value, main offenders being temperature, frequency, and field strength. So one type of widely used capacitor dielectric is the type 2 ceramic. This allows the manufacturing of extremely small size high capacitance components, but there is a very serious downside. So for this particular part, which is a 10 microfarad, 50 volt rated capacitor in a 1210 case size, we can have a look at the various graphs, specifically the DC bias characteristic graph. So this illustrates how the capacitance changes based on the applied DC voltage. So as stronger and stronger electric fields are applied to the dielectric, the smaller the dielectric constant becomes. For this particular component, at the maximum rated 50 volts, starting from the 10 microfarads, you're only left with 2 microfarads. So you have an 80% loss. Now, another thing we can look at is the temperature characteristic. So this particular component has a dielectric rated as X8L, which means that it can have plus 15 to minus 40% of capacitance based on temperature. Now, other types of ratings are defined, so based on the dielectric that you're using, you can have a smaller or larger variation. But anyway, this particular variation is also illustrated in one of the graphs. So this temperature characteristic is independent of the DC bias characteristic. So you can have both problems. The two graphs show the variation with temperature with no bias and with a specific 25 volt bias. Now, in general, class 2 dielectric capacitors are good capacitors, they're just not that great for precise filters. With inductors, when you're using a core, each core material has different properties. Usually, when choosing a core, you will do this based on the initial permeability value and the specific operating frequency in which it's supposed to be used. So if we just take a random material, let's say this N27 from TDK, and we look through the datasheet, so a good datasheet will contain quite a lot of curves, one of which being how the permeability changes with the applied signal frequency. So for this particular material, we have a very stable permeability up to around 2 to 300 kilohertz, after which it starts to vary. Now, when we turn to some of the other curves, one of them is the variation of permeability with temperature. So starting from the reference point at 20 degrees Celsius, when you go to about minus 40 permeability halves, goes from 2000 to 1000, and when you go to about plus 90, it will double. So there is quite a strong dependence of the magnetic permeability to the temperature of the core. The last thing to look at is the relationship between the permeability and the DC magnetic bias. So your permeability will stay more or less flat up until a certain intensity of magnetic field strength is reached, after which it will abruptly fall. So in general, any magnetic core will lose its permeability at high flux values when the core ends up saturating. Now, the examples that I've chosen are quite extreme, but these phenomena will still happen to some extent in all components. So when choosing the exact component necessary to build a filter, you don't just care about the component's value under some standard test conditions, but rather, you should keep in mind what the component's value is under your particular use case. In the case of inductors, usually for RF applications, when any sort of power is involved, air core inductors are used. Air is not as ideal as a vacuum, but it's the most stable material you can easily get. This way, the components will be relatively stable, even at very high frequency. Magnetic cores can still be used, but these are usually only present in small signal filters. 
so when saturation is not really a concern. With capacitors, commonly class 1 ceramics are used. These are far more stable than the class 2 we looked at previously, and when large values are needed, usually film capacitors are used. Last thing to mention is that both inductors and capacitors have equivalent series resistance. This is coming from the conductors that are used to build a component, but also from the materials used to enhance the field. Both the dielectric material and the magnetic core will absorb some of the field, turning it into heat. And this will appear from the outside as an increased resistance. This limits the realistically achievable Q factor, but also the exact performance that will be obtained with the final filter. So finally, I want to show the results of some LC filters that I've built. So these are intended to be used in a 50 ohm system as input filtration to an SDR, and the measurements will be carried out with a light VNA. So the first filter to look at is a high pass filter intended to be used to isolate the AM band. So I built this with some handmade inductors from quite thick wire, and even though I could have put the cutoff frequency a bit higher, so with the practical circuit the attenuation at the end of the AM band is only about minus 11.7 decibels, the pass band response of the filter shows very little insertion loss. So the low loss air core inductors are doing a very good job. Now another filter that I've built was intended to be a low pass filter that should isolate the FM band. So for this I used some very small SMD components, both the capacitors and the inductors, making this a very compact build, but the thin wires from which the inductors are made do have quite a bit of resistance. So on the measurement, other than the corner frequency, we can also see a slow but steady drop in the pass band. So the loss is increasing as frequency increases. The third filter is a band pass built for the 20 meter band. For this, I use some magnetic core inductors. And when we look at the measurement, even though the pass band frequency is as expected, the amplitude response isn't. So if not enough care is taken, the LC filter will have quite a lot of loss. And although this is a perfectly usable filter, a better one could have been built. Now, the final thing to mention about measuring filters is that it's quite important to look over the entire frequency range in which the filter will be used. So you never know when the response will do something unpredictable. So I remeasured all three filters, starting from one megahertz up to one gigahertz. Now, starting with the FM filter, well, nothing special happens. After the corner frequency, it just presents attenuation. And for the 20 meter band pass, it's more or less the same story. So other than something happening around 8900 megahertz, it will attenuate all over the place. Now, the high pass AM filter is a bit different though. So we do have certain dips appearing at around 400 megahertz and 800 megahertz. Now, using an AM filter on a 800 megahertz reception rig might not be a realistic use case. The point is that you need to measure to confirm what is the actual usable frequency range of your filter. So both the pass band and the stop band. In the end, the importance of component value stability and Q factor are highly application dependent. In something like a switch mode power supply, both the capacitors and the inductors can have tolerances of up to 50% and the circuit will work just fine. However, in filters, specifically very precise frequency filters, this is usually unacceptable. LC filters may be the best choice in multiple situations, but not always. So next time, we will look at some other ways of implementing filters, some of which rely on mechanical properties. But until then, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date on my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.